With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, the citrus industry is making preparations to avoid another bad thrip damage year. But our top story today is the California card check law. I'm talking with Brian Little, the Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau. Thank you, Brian, for taking some time with us today. I appreciate it. No problem. We want to talk about the card check situation in California. It's relatively new. So first off, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about what this is and why it matters. Okay. So uh, in 2021, the legislature uh, revised the Agricultural Labor Relations Act to allow uh, labor unions to petition for recognition as the collective bargaining agent for an agricultural employer's employees <clears throat> by simply collecting signatures on cards or petitions and turning that into the Agricultural Labor Relations Board. And if the number of signatures on those cards or petitions exceeds one, half, plus one, half plus one of the uh, number of the ag employer's employees at half peak season employment, then the Ag Labor Relations Board is required by law to certify that union as the collective bargaining agent for those employees. And that that's a radically different approach to trying to ascertain the wishes of employees to be represented or not from what we have traditionally had for the last 60 years, where assigning a card or a petition would be taken as an indication by the Agricultural Labor Relations Board of interest in uh, having a secret ballot election supervised by the Agricultural Labor Relations Board to be able to ascertain at that point in time exactly what the preferences of the majority of an employer's employees would be. There is no longer an election uh, if you use the card check, if the union chooses to use the card check procedure. And the problem with that is that cards can be or signatures can be obtained as much as a year in advance. Uh, there's no procedure for an employee to be able to withdraw a signature once given. Uh, no procedure for an employee to know to which employer this would apply. So very often they uh, might sign a document before they're even working for an agricultural, any agricultural employer for the season. And to have that signature then applied to an agricultural employer that they might not want to see unionized and they might like that employer and don't want to invite the UFW in. So there've been a number of these situations that have arisen in the last six months or so, uh, most particularly and most recently, uh, with respect to wonderful grapevine nursery in Wasco, where about 125 employees protested at the um, Agricultural Labor Relations Board's office in Tulare uh, to the effect that they had been deceived uh, by UFW. The UFW had collected their personal information for the purpose of distri distribution of a uh, debit card with federal aid for employees who suffered financial losses as a result of COVID-19. Uh, these employees uh, provided UFW with the information to receive that card, and these employees believe that UFW then converted that personal information to a unionization petition and is uh, getting the, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board to certify a union for employees that don't want it. Uh, that, that's a very serious thing, and that's the, one of the reasons why Cesar Chavez was such a strong proponent of having secret ballot elections, uh, because prior to the advent of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act, uh, growers were entering into what amounted to sweetheart deals with the Teamsters Union to try to stave off UFW unionization back in the late 1960s and 1970s. So secret ballot election is a much better way of figuring out exactly what employees want. We said that throughout the legislative process, and we were largely ignored by the current legislature. So it's unfortunate that we're in this position now where employees are are having their personal information apparently converted uh, for the UFW's purpose, but not for a purpose that the employees understood it was being used for. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back with Brian Little right after this. We're talking with Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau about California's card check law. We continue now. That brings up so many questions, and now a lot of them that you did answer already as you it were does, speaking. It does, doesn't it? I mean, there's but so many ways that could go. It, there really is. And yeah. 
you said it, but I'm going to say it again, but it it basically eliminates the election, first mm -hmm. off. Yes, it does, Sabrina. It pretty much eliminates an election as an option for a union to try to, an election supervised by an agency of the state government, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board. It eliminates that as a mechanism to determine what employees' current intentions are and preferences are about whether they want to be represented by a labor union. That that seems highly problematic uh, and something that you would think that the legislature and the state government would want to ensure uh, that they know exactly what employees' current preferences are for being represented or not. Uh, the passage of AB 2183 and subsequently AB 113 uh, apparently indicate that that's not what they're concerned about. I mean, obviously, this has made its way through, you know, becoming a law. And there was quite a bit of opposition to it as well, from what I understand, still became law and has now been used. I mean, I I, I want to ask what kind of outcome do you think that this could lead to as it's used even more? But I mean, we kind of know. But, you know, what could we see down the future as these cards, as the card check program is used more. It's hard to predict what's going to happen, uh, partly because there are times when uh, UFW seems to be a bit unpredictable. So early on, they went after some medium-sized and relatively small employers, uh, and they have had some success in doing that. Most recently, when they decided to attempt to unionize uh, both the wonderful Grapevine Nursery in Wasco as well as Justin Wine, which is another uh, um, re uh, another part of the wonderful complex of agricultural companies, um, you know they're they're going after a very large employer with a huge number of employees. So it's just hard to predict what UFW might try to do from one minute to the next, because um, we had thought that they might use uh, card check as a mechanism to try to unionize a number of small and medium-sized employers, but it appears that they have decided to go in a different direction. Uh, what's interesting is that they have been submitting a card check petition about once a month since the beginning of the year. Uh, one has not, it's the 12th of April, and none has appeared in April yet, as far as I know. So uh, they, they may be thinking about how they want to try to, to digest uh, these two groups of wonderful employees and what they're going to do going forward with that. So let's talk about the small farmer or the medium farmer. What can this mean for our farmers if they decide to, if the employees decide or UFW decides to go in and, you know, force this kind of un unionization? Well, it would obligate an employer of any size. It doesn't really matter whether it's a small or medium sized employer. It would obligate them under state law to engage in collective bargaining uh, with UFW for an employment contract. Um, that's a pretty significant departure uh, from common practice in employment in agriculture and really in all industries. Uh, almost all of us, myself included, probably you too, uh, don't work under an employment contract. You know, we're at will employees. And our if our um, employer is dissatisfied with the quality of our work, I suppose it could terminate us at any time. I've been in this job for 15 years and it hasn't happened yet. So I guess it must be doing something right. But an employment contract is a completely different animal. Uh, it introduces a third party into the relationship between an employee and an employer, uh, that being the union. Uh, that union has the right to um, take 3% of the employee's pre-tax earnings as dues to the union. Uh, they can direct employees to uh, to they they can they can intervene into the relationship between an employer and an employee over issues like promotions and assignments, training, uh, management of grievances, and things of that nature. Uh, that you just those of us who are not union simply take care of those problems with our own employers at our own in our own way and at our own speed, uh, without having a third party getting in the middle of it. Uh, so and then once you enter into collective bargaining with the union, uh, the legislature changed the Ag Labor Relations Act in the early 2000s to introduce a new mechanism uh, called mandatory mediation and conciliation, which really isn't that. That makes people think of like baseball arbitration when an owner of a baseball team is negotiating with a star player about what that player's contract is going to be. 
And what those arbitrators do uh, is they essentially um, look at the owner's offer and look at the player's offer and then pick one. Uh, that's not what happens with it's, it's called mandatory mediation and conciliation. But what it really is, is enforcement of a collective bargaining agreement administered by the state. So a, a so-called mediator who is hired by the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, virtually all of whose staff are former UFW or California Rural Legal Assistance attorneys, uh, they, they will hire a mediator. That mediator will look at the course of negotiation that has occurred up to that point between the employer and the employee, the employer and the union, and impose a collective bargaining agreement on the parties. Given who hired that so-called mediator, I'm sure you can guess as to which one of those two parties that enforced agreement is going to be more uh, favorable to. And uh, the it, in the the law right now allows either party, although it's always going to be the union, to invoke mandatory mediation and conciliation if collective bargaining doesn't result in an agreement within 90 days. So um, at least the, the first of the card check petitions that the Agricultural Labor Relations Board certified in October of last year, um, that 90-day period has passed. I don't know if, if mandatory mediation conciliation has been invoked. I'm not aware of it. Um, I know that in that particular case, uh, the employer is is pursuing objections to the validity of the card check certification. So I don't really know how that's going to turn out. Uh, this the, one of the later ones, um, actually, let's see, actually, the one in January and the one in February, both have no. The one in January is past the ninety day deadline. I don't know if the one in February has yet. And, you know, once once a certification occurs, the parties generally don't talk very much about what's going on. They, they, they usually prefer to be confidential about it, at least up until an agreement is reached. So I don't really have any insight into exactly what's going on in the, those negotiations. But I'm sure that they're going on, given the, the gun to the head uh, that's um, posed by the mandatory mediation and conciliation provisions of the Ag Labor Relations Act. We will continue with Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau, later on in the show. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we'll be back right after this. We're talking with Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau, about California's card check law. We continue now. And so much of this seems to be one-sided. So much of the whole, the entire situation seems to be one-sided. Is there anything that our farmers can do to prepare, protect their their businesses? Or, um, you know, what's the best thing for a farmer to do? I think the most important thing that a farmer can do uh, is going to be to be very careful about minding P's and Q's over employment-related things, making sure that people get 10-minute net rest periods, uh, which which means that they get 10 minutes to actually rest after they have moved from wherever they're working to wherever they're going to take their rest period and then back again to their work location. Same thing with meal periods. Um, the, you, you think about the kind of things that would annoy you as an employee that your employer might do. Those are the, exactly the kind of things that agricultural employers need to be thinking about and need to be avoiding in the case of their employees, because you don't want to be doing things that will cause them to seek intervention by a third party. You you want them to know that your door is always open if there's some kind of a dispute going on. You want to be aware of what's going on with them. You want to be certain that all of your supervisors are behaving appropriately at all times with respect to your employees. Unfortunately, in agriculture, particularly male supervisors with respect to female employees. Um, so those are all things we need to be be mindful of. Training uh, supervisors to make sure they understand the requirements of labor laws that relates to agricultural employment, uh, making sure they understand issues related to uh, harassment and equal treatment of employees, uh, and just simple things like being careful about how you schedule people. Uh, making last minute changes in scheduling for work uh, because agricultural employees, like almost all employees, uh, they they have child care issues they have to mind to. They might have elder care issues they need to mind to. 
and a last minute change in schedule uh, can really be difficult for them to deal with, just like it would be for any of us. So, the, the, and, and, you know, over in the overall, in the biggest possible picture sense, you know, Farm Employers Labor Service offers uh, training to agricultural employers and to their supervisors to help them understand exactly what card check is, what they can and can't do when they're dealing with employees to avoid having an unfair labor practice charge brought against them, um, and what they and and how they can and things they can do, steps they can take proactively uh, to try to avoid that situation. The problem is that the way the Agricultural Labor Relations Board has been administering card check, it's really hard to know uh, what you might be able to do to avoid a problem with card check because uh, the, the the process is a bit like a black box and the parties to that process, at least the employer party to that process, doesn't really have any meaningful insight into how the Agricultural Labor Relations Board is administering this thing. To give you an example of this, in at least a couple of the cases uh, that have occurred so far, uh, the employer has been, have, had, a couple of these employers have been declined any opportunity to offer any information to the board staff to be able to evaluate whether or not signatures on a petition, petitioning for recognition for a union, actually belong to any of the employer ease that that employer was employing at the time that certification was sent forward to the Ag Labor Relations Board. So they're not even, as near as we can tell, they're really not even trying to verify signatures in any meaningful way, uh, which I think is just extraordinary uh, because you're at that point, the board and their staff really are not serving their original legal purpose, which among other things was to try to ascertain the actual wishes of employees at a point in time to be represented by a union or not, because an important feature of the Ag Labor Relations Act which Farm Bureau supported at the time, didn't support the underlying act, but supported adding to it uh, a feature that em that employees should have a right. If they're going to have a right to decide they want to be represented by a union, they should also have a right to decide they don't want to be represented by a union. And that's been part of our policy ever since the Ag Labor Relations Act was passed, and it still is. You know, we support, generally our policy supports, Farm Bureau's policy supports um that employees should have an uncoerced right to be able to decide whether they want to be represented by a labor union or not. And the or not is very important. Um, given the proclivities of the people that run this state right now, uh, the or not part kind of seems to escape them for some reason. They're, they're not particularly interested in the idea that employees might not want to be represented by a union. Uh, it never seems to occur to them. And if you talk to a lot of them, they will say, oh, every employee ought to be represented by a union. Well, you know, not everybody wants to be represented by a union, but because so many of our legislators and public officials are, for example, uh, former union organizers, uh, they're not really interested in the possibility that employees might not want to be represented by a union. And I think that's reflected in the way they're administering things like card check and the way they administer a lot of other things that they do is they're just not interested in the possibility that people might not want to be represented by a labor union and might not be interested in paying union dues or having a third party come between them and their employer. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back with Brian Little right after this. Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau about California's card check law. Given the people who are in office and are on the boards, um, is there anything that can be done about it at this point, or is this pretty much what, how it's going to be and how it's going to continue to be? Well, um, we are, we are pursuing any legal avenues that we think might be available to us. I can't really give you any more detail than that because I don't really know what we're going to be doing. We are investigating a number of ways that we can look at to try to use legal processes to um, defend the rights of both employers uh, to be a part of a process that's actually fair to them, which the current process is not, um, or to vindicate rights of employees who, it seems, on at least a few occasions now, 
have had their rights infringed at a minimum, if not outright violated, uh, by the actions of the UFW and by the actions of the Agricultural Labor Relations Board to apparently refuse to pay attention to complaints being lodged by employees that their personal information was misappropriated for a purpose that they did not intend. So I think that's, I think, I, th I think that's about all I can say right now, because I, I don't, we're still looking at trying to figure out what we can do. And I don't think we really know yet exactly what we can do, but we are, we are looking at any avenues that might be available to us. We just haven't settled on a course of action yet. Yeah. So for farmers who are, or for, I should say for ag employers who are, you know, concerned or who would like to know more, um, or maybe they are starting to experience this in their uh, in their business. What should they do? Well, the other thing I do, in addition to being director for human resources policy for farm for employment policy, I should say for Farm Bureau, is I operate a um, I'm, do the handle the everyday operations of a uh, small company that Farm Bureau owns called Farm Employers Labor Service. Uh, we have four bilingual field staff who train supervisors and employers and employees about a whole variety of things from first aid and CPR training to tractor safety to uh, to training on what car check is and how it works. And we've done a number of those trainings so far. And we have people who are available to do more of that for an employer if they're interested in trying to get their supervisors trained up about car check and what they can and can't do and what they can be doing proactively to try to avoid this situation. The problem is that the process of card check is so shrouded in mystery at this point uh, that it's hard to know what to do. Um, it's, it, there's just, um, there, there, just aren't, there aren't a lot of positive indicators about things you might be able to do because of the nature of the card check procedure where the labor union goes out, they get people to sign documents of some kind. Uh, in this case, it appears that they may have gotten them to sign documents in order to receive uh, financial relief for losses they may have suffered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and may have, again, you know, may have misappropriated that information for a purpose for which it was not intended. And that's exactly what the employees at um, wonderful nursery have been saying, have been complaining about. So to the extent that there's a, that the procedure countenances that kind of behavior, um, it's pretty hard to know exactly what to tell an employer to do that's going to bulletproof themselves. I don't think there is any bulletproofing yourself right now. Um, it's going to be a, pr a process of making sure that your supervisors understand what card check is, uh, making sure they understand all of the things that California labor law requires them to do and that they're doing that very carefully uh, and to avoid situations where you um, where you create problems and annoyances for employees that you don't need to create. You know, there, there are things you can choose not to do uh, to not buy trouble for yourself and being aware of what those things are and not doing those things uh, could be very beneficial. So in addition to the training that Farm Employers Labor Service does, we've also published a guide for supervisors about unionization and card check uh, that we'd be happy to, to uh, provide for um, ag employers through our website. Uh, you can buy it, purchase it with a credit card. We think it's a very useful reference for people to be able to understand what card check is and how it works, how it's different from the election procedure that preceded it and why that presents potential problems for agricultural employers. So, you know, we can train your super, we can train you, we can train your supervisory staff. Uh, we can, we can, we can sell you uh, uh, a guidebook uh, so that you can under, read it and understand what this is all about. And uh, to the extent that you want to subscribe to my newsletter, we can be available to you to help you answer questions and work through problems. I can be available to you to help you answer questions and work through problems. My staff can train your supervisors. Uh, and to, and if you ever find yourself in a, in a serious legal 
problem. Uh, we have a group legal services program where our subscribers are eligible for two hours of free legal service with our partner firm, uh, Barsamian and Moody in Fresno, which by the way, has been the firm that to my knowledge has handled most of the card check cases that have arisen up to this point in time. And what was that website address for, for your organization? <clears throat> It's fells.net, www.fells.net, and you can find information on subscribing. And we have a lot of information that we put in front of our paywall, uh, but a fair number, a fair amount of information that we put behind the paywall and reserve for our subscribers and clients. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be back with Brian Little right after this. We conclude our conversation now with Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with the California Farm Bureau. We've been talking this morning about California's card check law. Now, if you've missed this conversation or if you want to hear it all in total again, you can always find it on our podcast. That is the Agnet News Hour, and it's available on your favorite podcast downloading app. Back to the conversation. Well, you know, there's, I mean, it's just a huge issue, and it has such an effect on our um, agricultural industry across California. But I, again, I thank you for your time. I want to give you the opportunity if there was anything that was left out or anything else, any other important points that you think our listeners need to hear. I think I think it's important uh, for I think it's important for your listeners to understand uh, that card check and the signing of documents has been going on for a couple of years now, um, and they may have employees and their farm labor contractors may have employees that have signed documents that apparently they did not know or did not intend. Uh, were are being used to indicate that they have an interest in being represented by a labor union. The Agricultural Labor Relations Board apparently is doing nothing to prevent that from happening or to not use those signatures that may have been misappropriated uh, for a purpose that the employee didn't understand when they gave that signature. Um, and so they need to be aware that this is happening and avoid doing anything uh, to make their situation worse than it may already be. They also need to understand that to the extent they're dealing with a farm labor contractor, and many agricultural employers do, they need to understand that as far as the Agricultural Labor Relations Act is concerned, uh, farm labor contractors, employees are their employees. And they are not, FLC doesn't exist for the purposes of the Ag Labor Relations Act. So should a farm labor contractor's employees, many of them have signed some document. And by the way, I would say that in addition to the, misappro the apparent misappropriation that may have occurred with employees at Wonderful Nursery, um, we, we've heard rumors uh, that the uh, Ag Labor Relations Board has accepted training rosters for safety training uh, as documentation of employees signing uh, for card check, which is clearly not, was not the intent of the legislature and does not in any way indicate or should not in any way be taken to indicate an interest in being represented by a labor union. Right now, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board is working on regulations to implement AB 113 and AB 2183. And um, those regulations, at least the draft that they've released, are woefully incomplete. Uh, there is a lot that needs to be adjusted in there, not the least of it being things that can make the, uh, the, the procedure for dealing with card check a lot more and, and signatures and trying to ascertain employees' actual intentions at this point in time, um, that, that there's no transparency to that process right now. The rules as drafted don't really give any transparency. And one of the things when we comment on those rules, one of the things we're going to be very strong on is that there needs to be a lot more transparency in that procedure than there has been up to this point or that there is in what the rules that the Ag Labor Relations Board has drafted and proposed. And to the extent that those rules don't provide for that, that may be another uh, point where we may look at potential litigation solutions uh, to try to create a process that's fair. Thank you again to Brian Little, Director of Employment Policy with California Farm Bureau, for joining us this morning for this important conversation. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's AgNet West headlines, here's Brian German. Citrus growers are making preparations to hopefully avoid another bad year of thrift damage. 
General Manager of Cobblestone Fruit Colby Campbell described the type of issue citrus thrips were last season and what many growers are doing to prevent a repeat of last year. We have seen, and this is probably one of the worst years for thrips I've seen since starting in 06. I would say, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for the equipment, the, the process equipment that we have installed or that we're, you know, we're operating on now to be able to sort it and identifying what makes, you know, whether it be a table, fresh market grade or a juice grade, because with the amount of damage that is there this year and heavy percentages, I've seen, you know, up to a 50% of a block fall out right be able to that it gets kicked the juice i haven't had to field juice anything yet but i have heard that other guys have had to field juice which means that you know that that whole crop was deemed unacceptable for the fresh market so it's all got to go to juice there wasn't enough in it to justify picking it and processing it we haven't run into that i have bad blocks that have definitely knocked on the door of that and a lot of it is just certain areas hot spots you know it was a bad year coming out of those record rains. And I think for me, bloom was a little bit, you know, one side of the tree would be ready when the other side of the tree wasn't. And so you had to make decisions. You either waited for the other side to go, which then exposed you on the other side because you let them, they were, they were active too long. And I think there's a lot of decisions in that. And I think at the same time, a lot of the smaller growers kind of got caught with some of the commercial sprayers that were busy because you were reapplying materials you know, more than you have. I, I've heard of guys having to spray three and four times, you know, just to continue to suppress the thrips this last year, where most growers are accustomed to a, a single spray, maybe a second spray in certain areas where it's a hot spot, but spraying three and four times, and you look at the, you know, the infrastructure of some of these operations, you know, they only have so much equipment and you can only spray so much, you know, depending on what your gallons breaker, and you can only cover so much ground. So, by the time guys were getting there, it was a little too late. I think fruit was getting chewed on and you can see that. So I know this year, I feel like going into this spring, there's a lot of eyes on it. Everybody's watching and I think everybody has made preparations. Guys have called ahead, tried to start, you know, seeing if there's other people, other custom applicators that are available. I know some farming rigs have purchased additional equipment just to make sure that, hey, if that comes again, we can't have this happen again because the fallout from it. I mean, you're, if you're losing 50% of your block to that, that's a significant amount of money that you've lost, right? Depending on the commodity. The digital farm management provider CropX Technologies has announced an API integration with Precision Drip Irrigation Solutions company WiseCon. The aim of the integration is to enhance data gathering and analytics for farmers. It will allow seamless incorporation of CropX's systems into WiseCon's precision irrigation network utilized across North and South America, Europe, and Australia. The collaboration anticipates benefits such as reduced water usage, increased crop yields, and improved resource management. CropX's farm management system amalgamates data from various sources like sensors, satellites, and farm machinery into an advanced analytics platform. With WiseCon's smart irrigation system integration, users gain access to comprehensive as-applied data directly within the CropX platform, enabling dynamic irrigation scheduling based on real-time conditions. The most important aspect of the Regional Conservation Partnership Program is its localized focus. A historic investment of $1.5 billion is being made available through the RCPP this year to help support conservation and climate solutions through partner-driven projects. Under Secretary of Agriculture, Robert Bonney emphasized the regional approach to conservation. So many of our conservation challenges don't exist just on one parcel of land. They cover an entire watershed or an area that might host certain wildlife or reduce soil erosion. We need to work across a lot of different producers, a lot of different landowners. What this program allows is local partners to do exactly that, to work directly with NRCS and local producers, implement conservation practices and do it at a scale that can be really meaningful for whatever resource issue you're trying to address. American cotton growers now have improved export opportunity in Bangladesh. For almost five decades, Bangladesh mandated fumigation of U.S. cotton due to boll weevil concerns. Collaboration between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Bangladesh Ministry of Agriculture amended import rules exempting the U.S. This benefits American cotton significantly as Bangladesh represents the fifth largest export market, valued at over $339 million in 2023. 
Efforts by USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service improved perceptions of U.S. cotton and provided evidence on boll weevil eradication, culminating in bilateral meetings and a Bangladesh delegation visiting U.S. cotton facilities. Utilizing the boll weevil eradication program not only helps growers eliminate pests, but it also enhances competitiveness for thousands of U.S. cotton growers. UC Cooperative Extension is hosting an organic workshop in Sonoma County next week. The event will be a half day of exploring the science and practices needed to manage organic cropping systems in the North Coast region. Presentations will include information about soil health management in organic systems, integrated pest management for insect pests in orchards and vineyards, and organic management of diseases and weeds. The event's scheduled to begin at 8.30 a.m. on Friday, April 26th at the Sonoma County Farm Bureau in Santa Rosa. Other topics of discussion include integrated pest management in organic vegetable crop systems, organic nitrogen management, and organic production economics. The event will conclude with a panel discussion with local growers. More information about the workshop is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Changes to the orange production forecast. Will there be more or less? That's coming up on this line of ours. Another 1% decrease from the previous forecast for all U.S. orange production, per USDA's April crop production report. Most of the action within the report originated with Florida's orange crop. Mark Hudson of the National Agricultural Statistics Service says while non-Valencia orange production remained unchanged month over month in the Sunshine State. Our Valencia oranges went from 13 million boxes to 12 million boxes. It's down 8% overall. Our all oranges went from 19.8 in March to 18.8 here in April. Other states reporting orange production for the season include California, their non-Valencias and Valencias, their oranges are unchanged. In total, USDA now forecast over 2.7 million oranges to be produced this season. I'm Rod Bain reporting. That's today's Top Agriculture News. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.